Linda, founder of President of Women in Art Initiative at Penn. And Women in Art Initiative was founded this semester at Penn to address the imbalance and presentation of art, bring recognition to and promote artists for feminist art activism and advocate for gender equality in the visual arts for all. Uh, where uh, she now goes through um, speaker events, exhibitions, workshops, campaigns, and studio visits, uh, and interviews. And we're also hoping to build a tighter community of Penn female students in the arts. So tonight's panel discussion is on women artists, representation, recognition, and promotion. And we're doing this to celebrate the women, the support women artists nowadays, which is going to be on March 28th. Um, we're honored to have three panelists here uh, with different backgrounds to share their experience and thoughts on the topic. So this event was made possible through the support of Penn Women's Center, um, the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Department, and the Social Planning Events Committee. So let me begin by introducing our panelists. Um, so Jen Deardorff um, is the Corp Director of Fellowship and Development at AIR Gallery in New York, a gallery that was founded in 1972 to provide uh, a professional and permanent exhibition space for women artists to present work of equality and diversity. She's also a member of Art Table and the College Art Association, as well as a coordinator of the Feminist Art Project. Ms. Deardorff received her BFA in Sculpture from the University of Kansas and an MFA from the University of Connecticut. She has been the artist in residence at Virginia Center for Creative Arts, the Vermont Studio, Studio Center, and the Contemporary Artist Center, etc. Her work has been exhibited widely, including Lancaster Museum of Art, Minnesota National Finale, and Sydney Rock, uh, Rockford Gallery in New York City. She currently works and maintains a student in Brooklyn, New York. Um, sitting next to her um, is Kelsey Helen Johnson. She's assistant curator of Locks Gallery in Philadelphia, a gallery that was founded in 1968 to present new, new works by many career artists as well as introduce the work of emerging artists to a national audience. Additionally, she undertakes independent curatorial work and fearless writing for reviews, articles, research pieces, and events. Ms. Johnson is also an artist, and her work has been shown at Box Popular Gallery, the Delaware Art Museum, the Philadelphia Fellow Art Center, and so on. Ms. Kelsey, uh, uh, Ms. Kelsey Allen Johnson completed her certificate in curatorial studies from Westland University and received her MFA at Penn with a certificate in landscape architecture. She holds a bachelor's degree in um, art and archaeology from Princeton. Um, and third uh, is Professor Virginia Maxi Movitz. Uh, she's also associate professor of art at Franklin Marshall College and a practicing sculptor. She's also a regular contributor to Sculpture Magazine and has written articles for artists' publications such as High Performance, Women Artists News, Atlanta Art Papers, and Art and Artists. Her scholarly essays have been included in the Encyclopedias of Sculpture and Art and the Public Sphere. She received her MFA in visual arts from University of California, um, San Diego, and she has exhibited her work at Alternative Museum and Great Gallery in New York City, as well as in college, university, and nonprofit galleries throughout the U.S. and abroad. In 1984, she was the recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Sculpture. And also, we have our moderator here, um, Kendra Bremen. She is a first-year history of art PhD candidate at Penn. Her areas of specialization are Lady Evil and Northern Renaissance, and she's interested in gender and sexuality as well as issues of reception. Before coming to Penn, she did her undergraduate study at U Chicago and her graduate work at the University of Texas at Austin. So before we move to the panel discussion, I just want to give you some statistics of, uh, from the National Museum of Women in the Arts. First, only 28% of museum solo exhibitions spotlighted women in eight um, selected museums throughout the 2000s. Georgia O'Keeffe once said, the men like to put me down as the best woman painter, I think I'm one of the best painters. Only 27 women are represented in current edition of the HWJS survey, History of Art, up from zero in the 1980s, and that, is, that text was uh, widely used in colleges, so we can imagine the fact. Um, through women, uh, though women are half of the MFAs granted in the US, only a quarter of sole exhibitions in New York are always feature women. And right here, I have a book about the power of feminist <coughs> art and um, the American movements of the 1970s, history and impact, and I'm going to pass around for your reference throughout the panels. Um, so I'm going to stop here and so I can just start the discussion. And I hope you will enjoy it. As you can see, we have a, a photo frame over there. Um, and after the panel, I hope you can stay and take pictures with it to show support for women arts. And we have a very um, large uh, photo coming on Facebook, and it has already reached um, 4,000 clicks. So um, thank you and enjoy. Thank you so much, Linda. 
for inviting us all here and making this happen. Um, we are going to have a format starting off with questions, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A. Um, and I guess, you know, Linda briefly introduced our guests, but why don't we begin with each panelist telling us a little bit about yourself. Um, when and how did you become interested in art? And did you always have a special interest in women artists or feminist art? Which direction? Oh, whichever you feel most comfortable. <laughs> Take it away. All right, I'll, I'll start. Well, I was always interested in, in art in that when I was a little kid, I loved to draw. Um, but I'm from a working class background, and I'm the first generation college educated. So not only wasn't I thinking that I could go to college, I certainly didn't think that I could go on to, to study art in higher education. Um, but my senior year in high school, I found out that the City University of New York at that time, back in 1969, was free. No tuition. <laughs> and I'm announcing this at 10, all right. No tuition, free. And it also had a really well-known art department. Ed Reinhardt had taught there. Um, by the time I got there, he was gone, but during my time, Philip Perlstein, Lucas Samaras, Walter Rosenblum, Sylvia Stone, and Lee Bontague were on the faculty. However, it was the late 60s, and many of my teachers were very sexist. The anatomy professor, who I'll never forget, Alfred Russell, and I will name names, uh, proudly stated, I've never given an A to a woman because they just get married, have babies, and throw their degrees away. Um, so I, I actually never took anatomy because he was the only anatomy professor I didn't want to study with. And then, although I received an A in my drawing class, um, that professor refused to write me a letter of recommendation for a grant because he said they wouldn't award the grant to a woman, so it was a waste of time. So he knew I was a good student. He was being a realist, waste of time. And then I found out from my sculpture professor, who was not sexist and who I'm still friends with, that I had been nominated for Phi Beta Kappa. He wrote a letter of recommendation, but then he told me none of the other professors had because they didn't think it was worth doing for a woman. So, um, you know, I had gone to an old girls' high school, and this came as a shock to me. I was used to achieving, and I was used to being rewarded for achieving. So my Brooklyn College experience certainly turned me into a feminist artist. Thank you. Um, I would, we're doing both questions about what is our interest in art and feminist art. I would say my interest in art started in a family trip to Paris when I was 14 or 15. Um, and it was the first time I realized that I was really turned on by art and my father like insisted on waiting in like, this you know, immense cattle herding in front of the Mona Lisa, which you can like see reproduced in scale everywhere else in the museum, with shops everywhere. Um, and I just kind of grew really impatient because we already walked through the hallways and we had our like floor to ceiling things, and I was just kind of like, I don't really want to do this, I want to go explore. And that was a big, it was, you know, it's a silly thing, but it was this big moment. And I went to a pre college program here in Philadelphia. Um, as I started dabbling in my own art, and I entered college thinking I was a scientist. Um, and I definitely, um, it was through taking classes with access to an art museum with a collection that I think I really started to open up my own eyes by working directly with pieces um, and seeing them and also having a pretty amazing group of faculty on my study with Emmett Gowan and um, he is kind of a scientist in the dark room, and so had kind of influenced me to think about the fact that artistic practice can be a kind of experimentation and research that you take on your own. Um, and my interest in feminist art, I mean, I guess it's just the most basic answer, it's just that I'm a woman, and so I'm interested. I mean, I wouldn't say that I'm particularly interested in feminist art, I'm interested in all art, and because there is underrepresented women in museums, queer voices, minority voices, all of the, I mean, I see feminism as not just about women, but about everything, and so that's just, it, it, it's impossible for me not to want to tackle those issues, even if they're not necessarily uh, relevant to my own practice personally. Um, it's become the crux of my day job, so. 
Um, I will echo a lot of those sentiments. I think um, uh, um, I think that my feminist inclination uh, I had prior to uh, the realization that I could be an artist or that that was an option, and um, uh, also grew up uh, in the Midwest from working class family, and um, realized actually fairly recently. I understood that um, my family never had uh, anticipated that I would go to college, and um, and that, and realizing that that was very self-driven. And um, but I think you know I found out that art was a thing that people were doing as, as a for a living um, as uh, a teenager um, when I have a cousin who had taken art classes in high school and was, like making objects and. Um, I think I had always been creative as a child and then realized that um, that was a thing that could be a job. And so um, that was sort of an uh, awakening. And I went around college for a couple of years before that happened and then like kind of put two and two together and went to art school. Um, uh, as like an early 20 something, I think, um, by the time that happened. So, um, and, uh, and also my interest, um, I don't know, also that I'm necessarily interested in feminist art, and it's a separate category of interest in feminism, but um, that I also view feminism as a, a human rights issue, and um, so so I'm interested in art that uh, gives voice to a lot of those things. Thank you, ladies. We're off to a good start. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a Midwest working class family. Myself <laughs> <laughs> uh, included. Um, just as a follow-up question, um, as professionals in the art world, and as artists yourself, uh, what, if anything, are you and your organizations doing to promote women artists? Why don't we start with you and then Carol? Well, that's fair. Yeah, yeah let's, let's do that. that. <laughs> that sounds like a very, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just how do I do that? Um, so I work currently at Locks Gallery, but I'm also a member of a collective called Vox Populi, and I used to work there, and I think um, both of those things have their own elements of activism. I think collectives and the history of all alternative artist spaces is incredibly important to this history of women in the arts, um, if only because they're self-organized. Um, and that is an important way that women and minority and queer voices have made opportunities for their own exhibitions. Um, and <laughs> Vox certainly has kind of, has some waves, but I think right now we are at 17 hours. 25 artists, I wrote it down. 17 out of 25 artists are um, women. I mean, and that's just a fluke, but it is, I mean, I'm a female executive director, um, which is, I mean, it's great. Um, I was offered the job at Locks, and it was pretty impossible to turn up because, um, specifically because of its history with women artists, and um, the gallery had championed early female artists in Philadelphia, like Edna Andrade and Elizabeth Osborne, who we've worked with since the gallery's founding, practically, um, but also did important um, ex major survey exhibitions of artists like Louise Bourgeois and Nevelson that were done with the artists for their estate and continue to do, I mean, pretty, what I see is pretty fabulous work with artists um, like Pat Sear, Jennifer Bartlett, um, Linda Banglis, and then on top of that, combining that with a lot of um, women artists from Philadelphia, like Jane Irish and Sarah McEnany, and I was looking at that Gorilla Girls thing, and we are, our report card is at 70%, so. And, and Fox isn't just a collective, you've done other shows, like The Alien She. Yeah, and I, wrote, and I helped write the grant for that. Um, which was, it was as I was leaving, um, but that was, I, and that's, I mean, I think the outside exhibitions that Pew has funded have always had very interesting perspectives on queer voices um, and the history of women um, in art and obviously rock and roll as well. Um, and that, I mean, it's, it's a space for radical ideas and rewriting histories, and I think that show is particularly interesting because um, a lot of people from New York came down to see it and were shocked that there was no New York venue um, because it was traveling to Yerba Buena to, from Harvey Mellon's gallery and they were like, why isn't this in Brooklyn? As if it you know, had to be there to be something and it couldn't possibly be, not be there, but I think that there's something to be said about a 
dominant uh, commercial market that operates very differently than alternatives and academic spaces um, and what's possible uh, in a city like Philadelphia, which I do have a lot of hope for. Um, uh, <laughs> I, um, so I'm currently the co-director of AIR Gallery and everything we do is about supporting women artists. Um, prior to that, I was the executive director of Sober 20, which is pretty much identical to AIR. But I'll talk about AIR because that's where I'm at now. Um, uh, but basically, it's a gallery, it's an artist-run uh, gallery, it's a nonprofit arts organization um, that was started to provide visibility for women artists um, in New York City. And uh, today, uh, we have about 22 New York members um, that are essentially, they comprise the board of directors, um, they are business owners. They are represented by the gallery, and um, they sort of facilitate all the operations. Well, the staff facilitates the operations, but um, but they are uh, very involved and help run the business. So, um, but all of our programming is uh, designed around providing visibility and support and resources. Um, a lot of what I do, I, I do development for the gallery and fundraising. Um, but I also oversee the fellowship uh, program, which we award six emerging or underrepresented women artists a uh, one-year membership to the gallery, essentially, and that comes along with career development, workshops, and various resources, studio visits, and things like that. Um, and so a lot of what I do is sort of uh, helping women to uh, develop their practice, kind of give them the tools to be able to do whatever their own goals are for their work. And it's not always about getting into a commercial gallery or it's not, it's never just one thing. It's kind of um, whatever their personal goals are. And so trying to help them find the tools to do that, make it happen. Well, what of the organizations I'm involved with is the Women's Caucus for Art and in a way I'm representing them today. And um, our chapter president is here, Kristen Oscar, that's one of our members, Jude Lane. Um, the, the Women's Caucus for Art actually grew out of the College Art Association, and it also dates back to 72 when AIR was starting to sort of coalesce. And it was actually art historians who founded the, the WCA. That's why the caucus is in the name, it's a caucus of the CAA. And the art historians were concerned that the, well, the board of directors at the time was all male, and the programming for the conferences was basically being set by the male members of the College Art Association. So the, the women of art historians got together and they started <coughs> talking about this and challenging the, the programming. And very quickly, studio artists became involved. And now the Women's Caucus, even though we have many art historians as members, and we have male members too, because the, the organization exists to promote the work of women artists, and men can do that too. Um, I think there are probably more studio artists and art historians in, in the caucus now. And I joined in 1978, right when I got out of graduate school. And how, how it works is the national uh, organization is the networking organization. It holds a national conference every year, always in conjunction with the College Art Association, because many of us belong to, to both. Even though I'd also say probably the majority of the WCA members are not in academia. So there's this overlap with artists and artists in higher education. But the, the national conference um, every year has an award ceremony, and we've given awards to a, a list of just some of the names. Alice Neal, and this is when everybody was still alive, all right? So Alice Neal, Louise Nevelson, George O'Keefe, Lucy Laporte, Yoyoy Kusama, Agnes Martin, Susie Gatlin, many, many, many others. Um, the national will also organize certain big exhibitions, um, like last year, there was an exhibition at the Lucian Academy of Art in China called Half the Sky, Intersections in Social Practice Art. And it was a way to get Chinese women artists together with American women artists. And there was an incredible dialogue that went on there. And our chapter right now is organizing um, a jury show at the Crane Building, which will be 
No. So within each of your fields, how would you describe the position of contemporary female artists? Do you find that women artists and women working in the fine arts, you know, galleries, museums, even universities, uh, face obstacles related to their gender? And what are those obstacles or limitations in terms of art production, uh, curation, and the job market? Round robin. <laughs> Uh, well, I am. I, uh, there's a lot of things. Yeah. So we take a couple rounds. Right. Yeah. Our time, and I want to make sure we hear I'll as much from quick. you as we can. I, I won't oh, go no, into, right. into too much detail, but I'll just tell you about like a couple of the things that I've been thinking about recently, um, and sort of uh, through my work at the gallery and also other these other like organizations that I work with. Um, what I've been thinking about and the concerns that I have currently. Um, one thing that I've been concerned about is uh, biases against women, uh, because I feel like it's one of the subversive ways that um, uh, women can be held back in a way that um, can be one of the more threatening uh, detriments to uh, sort of sexism. Um, uh, I, this, I feel like I'm repeating everything, but most of you haven't heard of this. I've been speaking to grad students today, so I've said a lot of this already, but um, uh, one of the things that I think about is like um, Marina Abramovic and um, her exhibition at MoMA and the kind of scrutiny and, um, and certainly there's plenty of examples of women who achieve a certain level of success and are really torn apart by media or uh, whomever and everyone maybe um, and criticized in a way that uh, a male counterpart wouldn't be examined so much that way. Do you have a, for instance, where I have to jump your head? Well, Marina Bromovic. We were just talking about Bjork. Yeah, we were talking about Bjork um, and the, you know, the, all the just hell raising that's gone on at MoMA over her exhibition and why that didn't happen for the Tim Burton show or, you know, there's just uh, other male iterations of a similar thing um, are not subjected to the same kind of um, scrutiny. And, so that's one thing that I'm really interested in, and how and how uh, you know how that can be addressed, or how these biases can be um, looked at in a way that we can separate them from what's really happening to what we might be cloaking our um, judgments in based on gender. Um, and then the other thing that I've become interested in is um, the market or sales mm -hmm. of. I mean, and I'm actually coming from a gallery, but um, sadly, there's not, um, you know, sales is not something that we focus on. We're a nonprofit organization, and so I think that that has somehow been a way for us to say, um, well, we don't deal with, it's not a focus for us, we don't deal with sales, you know, yeah, we're not good at it, so what can we do? There's, you know, whatever, there's excuses. But um, when I look critically at AAR and, you know, even, even Soho 20 and what's happening there, um, you know, Soho 20, they were concerned about sales and they still didn't get them. And um, the type of, you know, it's partly a business structure thing, it's partly the dynamic of a gallery like that, but um, the disparity of what women are making with their art versus what men are making um, is wildly uh, disproportionate. And um, I think it's one really concrete thing to look at when people are like, oh, well, are, how are women, you know, where is sexism occurring in the art world? That is a very obvious thing. And these are uh, mostly accurate facts uh, that, um, you know, the highest in the secondary market, um, the highest um, work of art I'm afraid that I'm going to be. I think I got your back. So, yeah. uh, yes, that's, yeah. so, uh, the highest uh, selling item, art uh, item uh, of uh, to date, um, which I believe was 2014, was like a Suzanne, Logan, something like that. The no, three, it's Bacon. 
Oh, okay. Why don't you tell these numbers? It was $142 million, and there's a new Picasso that they're saying the estimate is $140 million. Wow. The highest, I, I, this is in my house, so I want to just scroll <laughs> somewhere yeah. lost in the images. But the highest uh, female sale is a Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, it's $44,405,000. Yeah, this baby. Look at it. All forty-four million dollars. Um, <laughs> we we, we kind of have to like cycle through. There's just they're just for perusing. Um, believe these are individual sales, all right. Yeah. But I came across Benjamin Genovio, mm -hmm. who used to be critic for the New York Times, but now um, is the editor in chief of Art and Auction, has a listing of the top. 100 living artists in terms of overall sales, not just one piece. And of those top 100 living artists, five are women. So five percent. Right? Mm -hmm. So just how the market works, and I'm actually jumping around to all my notes here. Because, um, I can I also dig in. No, well, I mean. <laughs> You know, it comes down to art is a business, all right? Mm -hmm. And the reality is male artists sell better than female artists. Now, we'll discuss, you know, why that is, all right? I do um, want to discuss that. <laughs> right. Well, like, there's, a, there's a wonderful quote from um, the director of the Hayward Gallery in London, Ralph Rugoff, who says, um, we live in a world where male bravado and bad boy posing still gets a lot of attention. Most buyers of art are men. Most of the big buyers are men, and it may be that they buy work that reflects their sense of themselves, showy work by other men. All right? And then that gets sort of warped <coughs> into thinking that the market is the arbiter of quality, and there's a, this also a wonderful quote from George Vasilitz that um, was in the English Journal, the White Review. And Vasilitz said, quote, women don't paint very well. It's a fact. They simply don't pass the market test, the value test, as always the market is right. I remember when he said that. So where do you go with that for you? I mean, just recently, I was, this is, I mean, something I don't know talking about, and maybe it's insignificant to anybody but me, but there's a Christie's catalog, you know, they come, there's these glorious books that they must have in Sotheby's, and they have like a zillion art history students making these books with no author names, and um, five-page spreads to singular works so that they can sell for millions and millions of dollars, um, but there's, I mean, Tracy Emin's bed went for sale recently, and that's one thing, but the, there's a piece by Tracy Emin called Exorcism for My Last Painting, which is, uh, she locked herself in a room, she made, I think it's like 40, it's like 17 paintings, 44 works on paper, they're amazing things, like just unbelievably funny, lovely things, and so what was going up for auction was the entire body of work, her like bra, her like cereal box, her, like, of the whole room, like, she, she did this thing where she said she was going to stop painting, and she locked herself in this room, so you have her food products, I mean, literally what can be its own little museum, if you wanted to buy it and go put it somewhere, forever it could go live, and it should, like, definitely go live in the sack or something for feminist art, um, but anyway, I, I'm looking at the estimate, it's like, it just barely hit, like, one million dollars for the estimate, I don't know what it actually sold for. And then meanwhile, the like cover art or whatever is this uh, is a Gerhard Richter painting. It's a beautiful painting. It's a great painting. I love him. Seventy-two inches. It's like not not super big. There's nothing super special about it. It's a big squeegee painting. Fifteen million dollars for one painting. <laughs> and like this is in the same catalog. And it's just like what is this? Rick, Richter was number one on you know. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. Kind of overall. I, there's an artist at the gallery who's, I will not repeat her name because I don't know if she'd want me to repeat it, but she prices herself very reasonably out of her studio, and some pieces, I mean, you know, there's a negotiation of how much of the discount they're willing to offer, if it's only to museums, or if it's to collectors, if it's at our discretion, if it's to anybody just to seal the deal on the sale. Um, and she had worked on a piece 
that she had priced, and I think she came back to kind of thinking that she had priced it incorrectly, and she said, there's no discount on that, I already have the women discount. And I was like, women artist discount? I was like, okay, got it. Like, I, she just didn't mean to say anything else, because I was just thinking, if, and yeah, the man artist made this, it's this, you know, this huge, wonderful piece, like, there's no reason why I need the discount. It's priced at what it's priced. So, you know, to make the, this, this really explains, if you look at it dispassionately, I mean, this explains the disparity in commercial art galleries because they're businesses. They're trying to make money. And you, you mentioned the Gorilla Girls report card from 1986. There's a group called Pussy Galore. You know, they did the, the recent one, the gallery report. And um, it shows essentially that sex and, sexism is alive and well in New York City art galleries. Oh, yeah. They okay. did, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, they, but they did they did it just like the, the report for it in eighty six. Mm -hmm. And um, they found that uh, only five galleries out of the thirty four they listed had rosters of women artists that rise above fifty percent women. The most sexist of the bunch was Tony Chaprazi Gallery, um, who had only five percent women, followed by Marlboro at seven percent and Sperone Westwater at nine percent. And all three of those galleries were on the 1986 Girl Girls. Mm -hmm. But it's what sells. There, there's also an Australian um, feminist artist collective called Countess, Women Count in the Art World. And they tracked the number of women in the, Venice, the most recent Venice Biennale. And in the open, which is in the arsenal, there were 69% men, 24% women. The, the remaining 7% were groups, so they couldn't really rank those. In the pavilions, the, the country's pavilions, the tally was 74% men and 26% women. And uh, this Countess group went on to say that, assuming all of these countries have similar ratios of artists in general, and art school graduate ratios as Australia has, 35% male grads, 65% female grads, a male artist will have above five times more of a chance of showing at the Venice Biennale than a female artist. Yeah. And then and the other question is, are they women commissioning women? Because you have to have a commissioner, and so right. who's commissioning these people? Is it? I mean, that brings in this greater infrastructure question of where are women's positions in the greater art world? But um, I, it's so. I mean, the statistics are so infuriating. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know how to wrap my brain around them, but I think the other question is like fundamentally, which goes to I guess the first question, like um, the position of a contemporary female artist, which I think is painful because there's this question of are, are you a feminist artist or are you not? And the, the group of stuff that I put up was kind of a mix of both, but I think there's just artists that just want to be artists and they just happen to be a woman. And um, it was interesting because I think um, I'd like to to give kudos to our neighbor, the ICA, that's doing really amazing work with amazing female curators who are putting forward amazing surveys and um, of major mid-career artists. Um, but the Barbara Kasten show is like, you know, you read these interviews with her and she was just like, you know, people wanted me to be a sculptor or a photographer. Why did I have to be both? But also like, why does it have to be a question about what her female perspective is? Her background's in fibers. So like it's like when does the feminism end, or is just the act of being a female artist feminist? And I am continually frustrated by that. In my undergraduate education, I had a very prominent photographer who I adore ask me while showing work in a class, saying, "Well, what's your female perspective on this? You look like this, these look like male photographs." And I was like, "Well, what does that even mean?" Like I, like, I took them. I, I surely I'm influenced by history, which is a male-dominated sport, but I need it. And so here it is. And then I was telling another artist last night that I was, what the topic of this conversation was, and I said, oh, I'm talking about women in the arts. And he said, oh, the ghetto. And I was like... But, it, but, but it, you bring up something interesting that the caucus, um, I guess now maybe it was about five years ago when we did um, Battle of the Sexes. We, we did a show at the... Um, uh, Delaware Art Museum. It's called Battle of the Sexes. And those of us from the chapter who wanted to be in the show 
chose a male artist who would exhibit with us. But our names didn't go up, so you couldn't tell who was male and who was female, and we had these little ballot boxes, and you would drop a tag in that had either the male symbol or the female symbol. And there was a guy who worked with Fogers, and everybody voted that he was a woman. <laughs> uh, I came out kind of half and half, which actually surprised me, because I thought I was actually making art from a woman's perspective, but I just came out right down the middle. So, I mean, that, it was very telling, and then, then the museum reported the results, you know, and then who was actually... <coughs> This has got us into a lot of the material that I'm hoping we cover um, in a little, in some of our other questions. So, um, some of the things that I'd like to follow up on are um, thinking about this role of men in the arts, right? Like we were talking about how they're the collectors for whatever reason, right? <laughs> and historically, that's true. Um, what should we do to either um, encourage uh, women to start collecting, or is there a way to sort of uh, boost? a woman's presence in this art market? Or should we be encouraging men to be looking elsewhere? Like, how do we handle this art market question? And then, you know, on the other side of things, um, you know, historically, uh, some of the reasons women artists haven't been as popular or, you know, around at all um, is because of historical, cultural, social reasons, right? Things that limit their access to even materials. Are there those sorts of uh, questions still on the table these days, or um, is there some other reason that these classrooms full of young women artists are not pursuing art? So I know two different things, but those came out of that, that discussion. <laughs> well, I think first of all, I just I, I would like to clarify, I Matt. Mean, from my perspective, I think I walked into the contemporary commercial art world very naive and definitely thought that most collectors were male, and certainly there is a stratosphere of super collectors and for that matter, banks that are collecting mass amounts of art as a way of liquidating cash into physical assets. Um, and that's a different sport entirely, which is a male-dominated sport, but I actually think that the majority of collectors that actually influence museums, there's many of them tend to be couples that do it as an activity. Um, and I, I think that for me, that is the most interesting. Um, I mean, obviously I don't want to make it heteronormative, but I, I do think that that is um, pretty fascinating because it is this dialogue of kind of where tastes collide. And I think that for a lot of people who are in monogamous relationships, that ends up being something that you do want to share with your partner because it's where you live. Um, it's usually a, a kind of extracurricular passion. Um, but there's also super collectors like Aggie Gunn who are amazing. It was um, really enlightening to go to the Barnes uh, Foundation. They recently had a panel on collecting and it was for all four women, art, women collectors. Um, and so... And what are the women collecting? Well, that's the thing. I think it just depends. It's like, are you going with classic modernist masters and the word master becomes problematic or um, are you really doing your own thing? And marching to the beat of your own drum, but I just think that um, that you know I it's trying to instill bravery in collectors is a very difficult thing, and it depends on what kind of gallery that galleries that people are drawn to, and I think that the more um, the more I mean we all have a say, men. Male gallerists, female gallerists, everybody has a say in keeping a stable of artists that is representative of contemporary production, which is female, male, queer, white, black, you know, whatever. It's like, it's just the fact of the matter is that that's not happening. And when you're offering, everybody has gotten into these niche, uh, niches of, of male art history because that's a safe investment. And um, we need to, I mean, the, the blow of the art market is bogging down the conversation about what is actually part of our cultural heritage, which is everybody's perspective, so. I mean, you know, I would love to say that, well, we need to get more women as gallerists and positions of power, but we have them. Yeah. But and, they're tied to the market. And, and I'm, I can't blame them for being tied to the market. They're running a business. I mean, the same thing with the art magazine. Something that really affected co-ops over the years. Co-ops. AIR, Amos, you know, when I used to direct Soho 20 series, they used to get regular reviews in arts magazine. 
That started falling away in the 80s because the art magazines had to pay the rising rents. But you know, thinking of people like, well, going back to like Gertrude Stein and, and um, Peggy Guggenheim, they were mostly promoting male artists. There were a few women in, in the group, but mostly male. Then you have Solomon and Betty Parsons, that, you know, maybe there was a female or two, but it was mostly male artists because that's who they were selling well. Um, the two, there were two women who run um, Metro Pictures. Now, it's interesting that Helene Winter from Met Met Metro Pictures used to be at Artist Space, so maybe that's why Cindy Sherman is there, since Cindy was actually a um, receptionist at Artist Space. Um, but, it, you know, I mean, Mary Boone, look at Mary Boone. I mean, she basically made Schnabel and Sally's careers, right? Or Anina Nose and, and um, uh, Basquiat, I mean. It's, it's just very complicated. I think the issue is bigger than, than the art world. Um, you know, there's also uh, uh, the, uh, what you were saying about like uh, AIR getting reviews and stuff. Um, but I feel like there's this, you know, well, there's obviously a stigma around some of these issues. So, um, like recently, uh, Susan B, who was uh, I want to say founding member, but she might have been like uh, just in the 70s member. Um, uh, she had a show at AIR uh, in June, maybe, or maybe even a little earlier. Um, not reviewed. She has a show up now at a different commercial space and got a review in the Times. Um, Anna Medieta, who was part of uh, the early years of the gallery, um, you know, exhibited, actually met Carl Andre at AIR. I didn't know what you were saying. Uh, and, um, so she, and now there's like this sort of um, large show. Actually, she has quite a bit of things happening um, before she's not alive, but um, she, you know, she's getting all this kind of publicity. So there's this weird thing of like um, the their successes, you know, like uh, with AIR, we, like it's almost, they're getting more success um, outside of that. And so, something that I think co-ops did, and I mean they still sort of did, but co-ops and non-profit spaces, I used to call them the R&D, the research and development for the commercial art world. So you had Cindy Sherman at Art and Space. AIR also Dottie and then Dottie moved over to PPOW and then became more famous because of that. But if you go back to the 1950s, Hansa Gallery, Tanager Gallery, people like George Siegel, um, Philip Pearlstein, Alan Capra, they were members of co-ops. Uh, gallerists like Richard Bellamy and Ivan Carr, they were connected with the co-ops. Something happened where then the status of co-ops kind of slipped. They became confused with vanity galleries. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I mean, co-ops have a strict review process. You can't walk in the air and say, I'm going to show. Yeah. Like, no way. <laughs> Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, but, but, I, but I think that changed dramatically. So I think co-ops actually played a role maybe in the, the 70s and, and early 80s where they were able to get women artists somewhat visible because they had shows, they were reviewed, people would say, oh, who is, who is this woman? Let me go see. And it might be somebody who's a gallerist who then would snatch that woman up. Well, if they're not getting reviewed, it's not going to happen. I mean, and I tend to look at the gallery as, well, my hope is that it's a catalyst for artists to sort of, uh, you know, take their career further somewhere else. Um, that doesn't always happen, and, you know, uh, it's unfortunate that, you know, I feel like some of the artists at um, AIR do also feel like that their history is being kind of taken away from them because artists will be a success in a different sort of realm and then it's not affiliated with AIR at all. And so there's that kind of thing. But um, back to the collecting thing, I'm, I was wondering too what um, you think about um, collecting as activism. Like, um, you know, how you spend your money is like uh, some kind of voice that people have. And, um, 
Because there are women, you know, there are women with money, there are women collectors, there are women in positions of um, authority in various galleries or museums. Um, but that doesn't do much if they're not interested in supporting them. I really like that question. Um, I want to come back to it. <laughs> we are running out of time, and I definitely want to stop with this question. This, uh, since we're here, and most of us are not career professionals yet, I'm hoping maybe you can give us advice. Um, you know, one piece of advice if you are entering, you know, either if you want to do art or if you want to work with art, um, what might you tell our audience? I say, just do it. Don't wait for permission. Don't wait. So the commercial art world, organize if you're an artist, show, join collectives like Fox or any of the Grizzly Grizzly. Uh, actually, Philly's in a good position, probably because we have affordable rent, that there are a lot of collectives. Um, join, join a group. You can do much more. You know, I mean, have your own numbers. say in it. And right. you take ownership over your own actions, which is, I mean, which is part of, I mean, to, to maybe circle back to exactly what you were saying, I, like, we shouldn't be saying it's a problem that artists get scooped up out of these things in the commercial galleries. Like, women should be in commercial galleries, so that's fine. And, like, there's always a question of, like, what's the sustainability of the support you can offer somebody once they hit this new level of their career? Because when you have more money, you can do bigger projects. You want to have big catalogs. You want to have an art historian write for you. I mean, the reality is that there ends up being a system because there's more resources up the food chain. But, like, you know, if an artist leaves Vox because they get a Q fellowship or because they have joined a commercial gallery, that is a success story, period. Um, but I think that you know you do just have to start somewhere. But I think that um, I think that no one should be scared of ghettoizing their work by talking about their identity, even if their work isn't about their identity. Um, it is, I think, I hope a world that is changing. I think that the academic museums and nonprofits are extending to install spaces like ICA Philadelphia, ICA Boston. Uh, we are seeing more female curators at these institutions. Um, they're doing great surveys and making things are historically relevant, which does influence the market very significantly. Um, but we need more women on boards of museums that are going to make pieces for permanent collections happen. And that's where buying is political. And when you have important pieces, making a legacy of donating them somewhere so that they can go live in a permanent collection and be a part of public history, um, which I think is really, really, really important. Um, as an artist, my advice would be to um, maintain integrity in your studio practice and to have um, to always make things that you believe in and that you love and um, that you are behind so that there's always like a kind of fire happening in your studio and that we believe in it. And as an administrator, I would say um, to uh, ask for what you want and to not sell yourself short. And to, you know, um, this is in terms of like setting prices for your work or, you know, I am always floored by artists that I work with that have impressive resumes and they will say things like, well, no one's going to come. Or I don't, you know, like they're just so like, flippant about the importance and severity of it, and I would say this is your responsibility as a woman artist to, um, you know, present yourself in a strong way because you're studying, you're pioneering for other women to come behind you. So uh, it's important that you take yourself seriously, that you present your work in a professional way, and that you care about what you're doing um, because you're still paving the way for what's happening. You're still like making history. And I think this question of doubt is really important because I think that, I mean, especially from a female perspective, women are raised on doubt about our body images, about lots of things, and that becomes a greater psychology in everything that you do. And doubt can also be, like, self-doubt and self-criticism can be a very powerful tool in that it's a great law for self-governance, it makes you a better artist, it makes you your own worst critic. Um, but at the same time, where is the point where that pushes you and where is the point where you let it go and you embrace what you deserve? And um, I think that that's a really serious question that comes into like just the very rudimentary psychology of, yeah, 
artists with great resumes that just, I mean, somehow have something holding them back, and it's like, why is this continuing to happen in the images we project about ourselves? So. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your thoughts and your advice. Um, we're going to turn it over to Q&A after applause. Um, <laughs> consume, which I think that curators are consummate consumers and the best thing you can do is expose yourself to the widest variety of things and be voracious about it. Um, but I also think that there's an element of friendship and it's like, it's, it's going out and meeting artists and saying, what do you do and can I come to your studio? Um, and that's, I mean, that's the heart of curatorial practice and people are, dead. artists are in their studio a lot by themselves. They want to have people come and talk to them about their work. Um, and I think the best curators are the ones that really put themselves out there and go into studios, have conversations, because you never know when you're going to be able to pull from those past experiences and say, like, oh, I know this person that does this thing, and that's perfect for this show. Um, and the more art you expose yourself to, the more you start to have a taste and a vision of the kinds of shows you can make and put together, you know, interesting, provocative um, surveys of what you think is happening contemporary art or art history. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that um, there should be more responsibility on the part of all curators, of everybody, um, of men and women, and um, uh, you know, to uh, consciously make decisions that include um, more variety of artists in all capacities. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just, yeah, the ball But it's interesting I tell artists a lot to um, uh, invite, you know, to share their work with people and have them <coughs> so it, it like mirrors what you're saying about studio visits. You know, the, it's one of the most um, important parts of the relationship you can have with uh, another artist or another collector or a curator. Have you invited them into the studio? And I also feel like a lot of artists don't realize how, um, but that's always an opening door. You can always ask anybody, curator, writer, anyone, uh, to come to your studio. They don't all, they won't always do it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, there's also a lot of accessibility you have to some of those people. Um, you know, David Swerner might not come, but Jason Andrews might come, or, you know, there's plenty of other, uh, so many people that you can ask and invite, and yeah, I feel like it's part of the job of being an artist too. But it'll be nourishing, you know. I think it's I think it's good feedback. I have a question. Is that, is that still recording? Okay, I'm just curious about whether the recording is going. Depends depends how I'll frame my comment. <laughs> um, I just, I want, I, I really want to thank the students who organized this. I think you did a really good job. And um, I'm so glad to see this happening. My name is Lizzie. I'm the director of the Women's Centre here at Penn. And for our 40th anniversary, I went to the art department, not the art department, but the curators at Penn, and I said, we want to hang some art by women. We're 40 years old. Give us some art. We'll put it up. It'll make it part of our 40th anniversary. And I got the statistic, which I shared roughly with you, um, that there's about 7,000 pieces of art owned by Penn, most of it donated by donors. Um, and about 100 of those pieces are by women. 
So if you want a figure, that's an interesting figure right there. So it speaks to a lot of this market. But this is an interesting market. This is the market of tax write-offs, right? Mm -hmm. This is the other end of the... Well, that's collecting at the stratosphere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. too, right? So Penn, you know, I mean, I'm not blaming Penn. Penn takes the gifts that we're given, but that's the... So I would encourage the students, and those of you who are feeling really emboldened by this panel, we need an inventory of what is hanging on all the walls in all of our buildings. Because I feel very strongly that in the same way that it, we say of politics, if you can't see it, you can't be it, I think that this is an educational institution. If all the art that we see on the walls at Penn is by men, if all the statues on campus are by men or of men, and this isn't the case, but I'm saying it's very skewed right here at Penn, we could start by having students go building to building to building. Because of those 7,000 pieces, many of them are just in storage. And the good news, if there's any good news in this story, is that of the very few pieces that Penn owns by women, many of them are actually out. Because other people clearly have asked, do you have them by any women? <laughs> <laughs> so the stuff we have by women is disproportionately on display relative to the stuff we have by men. Sorry to call it stuff, it's your life and <laughs> <laughs> These beautiful pieces. Um, so I think we need to know what's out, what's, what's out there at Penn and, and be able to, on the basis of some solid data, maybe make some suggestions for how we could even things out right here on campus as, you know, start, start right here. Well, you know, since I'm an academic institution, the one little, very tiny piece of power that I feel I have in sort of influencing the future is also, I, I keep my own slide collection. And so I'm not just relying on art store or some sort of, you know, organized uh, collection that might come out of um, museum holdings or something like that. And when I teach, I always show lots of slides of work by women artists, and I'm not showing them within the women artists ghetto. I'm showing them. I teach sculpture. I'm going to talk about her school about her art form, and and I'll talk about Martin Kurgan. And my students, pretty much at at, at them, they, they come in, we don't have a BFA, it's, it's a BA. So they come in, they don't know anything about art. So no matter which artist I show them, I could show them an artist that I might have gone to grad school who has never been collected, but makes fabulous art. They think that artist is famous. <laughs> and it, it's sort of a way to sort of get with an artist and, and artists of color, you know, a whole variety of artists that have been underrepresented in collections. Through academia, we can actually do something. Yeah. We can get the images. And that points to a thing which is just that, like, context, I like what you said, and I think that relates to the context of exhibition. It's like, what is the context in which things are shown? And I always think back, like, I have a lot of friends that are in music, and it's like, you have one girl in your band, and all of a sudden you're the girl band, so then you're on the bill with other girl bands. Right. And it's like, I mean, this, PowerPoint is problematic because it's like it's like just like putting together a bunch of stuff, mainly which is women's tackling women's issues. But like, what happens when you you know just present something in class like it's normal? I think there's a place for activism in teaching and curating. And there's a place for just presenting it like it's just the way it is. I mean, I think that for example, like Helen Molesworth, who is now at LA MoCA at ICA Boston, she did a show about the '80s called This World We've Been. And the 80s was an era where the, that macho supermarket man dominated. And she made the crowd pleasing with major pieces by those artists. And she inserted, I mean, a whole section about queer voices and a lot of women that I just never even heard of that were major producers in a decade um, and made it a survey. And so what does it mean just to do that as just an activity that doesn't have to be special? And the same thing with Penn's collection, like having a piece in the Women's Center versus having a piece on the wall of Wharton are two very different things. Um, one obviously probably says that this is by a woman artist, but like when, you know, you've got to have it trickle down everywhere so that the context is in all different kinds of discussions, I think. I do the same thing with my high school students. Yeah, you start artists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> start even earlier. And I just give them lots and lots of women artists to research and present to the whole class. And I, I drop a few men in there, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of a question following up, or in the same vein as what we're talking about now. 
something that I've been thinking about in terms of women and art, women and, art um, and feminism in general, I guess, is um, women who are artists but don't necessarily want to be labeled as a woman artist. So I guess how much of an obligation do you guys feel there is in terms of promoting the feminist aspect of your art and then how much of it should be just to talk about my sexual identity or my gender identity in my work because it's just my work and I don't, I wouldn't, I mean I wouldn't object if somebody wanted to put me in a show of all women artists, um, but it does like flavor the reading a little bit um, and I, but at the same time I, you know, obviously I'm a pretty advocate, I'm pretty loud about my opinions about where equality should stand, but I think that just like continuing to make my work and make my work about the issues that I care about and assume that it's just as valid as if anybody else said it and just put it out there is, is my political gesture as a feminist. I, you know, the context thing I think is really key because, you know, some of my work actually does deal with women's issues, all right? And maybe that's feminist on it, um, but I think the definition is, is broader too in terms of what feminist art means. But some of my work doesn't deal with that. It deals with architecture. Like right now I'm working on this piece where I'm casting bones and tools and gluing them to the wall. And I don't know what skeleton I cast. I don't know if it were had been a male or a female. All right. So I don't know the gender of those bones. All right. And that one, that piece really is nothing do with my other pieces except a certain crossover having to do with architecture. All right, so in some cases I'm talking about karyotids and women's bodies in architecture, and in other cases I'm talking about the bones of a building. Uh, you know, so depending on where it's shown and what context, it, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be shown however you want to show it. <laughs> but I think it's interesting, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, I've probably seen it come up a couple times and there is some like dirty images. So, okay. Anyway, but the Linda Bangless ad, which is oh, the, 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 so she's, it was an art forum, and she was um, essentially commenting. She had to pay to take that out, and she was talking about how she had to pay money essentially to get on the pages of art forum when it was dominated by men. Um, and that ad, well, was, she, she bought it. Yeah, you still have to pay. Yeah, it. no, but I'm saying but the fact that the coverage and the covers. I mean, there was these, you know. I mean, just unbelievable disparities about how many women were on the cover of Art Forum, I mean, how many reviews, let alone the fact that the, this insulting, like, I'm having a show and it's not getting coverage, therefore I'm going to take out this ad and you can't ignore it. Um, but she's a sculptor. I mean, she, she certainly is an overt feminist and she continues to be, but I think that it's just um, tremendously interesting to see how since that's so juicy and so topical, every single article, even now when she's just making gigantic bronze blogs, right, and like she big poly poly yeah. polyurethane fountains, um, that every article has to start with the lead of that art forum topic. And so it's like, at what point can those gestures overshadow something? I mean, I think that we should read her art as female and about flesh and about um, form and about what is feminine sculptural space, and that's important, but when any any review or any biopic has to start with like, well, this woman wanted to set herself apart from the boys. And I, the other thing was this, there's a show, this is a very important show that happened in Philadelphia, which I recommend you all find the book for. Q funded it, and Sid Sachs, who's an amazing curator at UArts, put it together. Um, the only art history of women pop artists. Um, and the, the, there's another slide of something, which I think is problematic, but a really cool show, which is called Bad Girls at the New Museum. And like the title is tantalizing, certainly, but like, what is it like? You know, why is there a different standard for transgression for women? And so, what happens when you put these group shows together that kind of, you know, I mean, it's some, it's something that of course happens that we as individual artists do as well as curators is, and we're trying to get press. So your marketing and the bad girls was a catchy title, mm -hmm. and it got the press. It's a great title. <laughs> <laughs> Provocative. Um, one of the stats that you guys had mentioned was the percentage of females versus males uh, coming out of art schools now. And I was just wondering if you think that that will ultimately change this, like, you know, 
patriarchy of the art world and like the preference given to male artists because there aren't as many, it's not as masculine a thing to produce art now as it was in like the 1980s or like a certain point in time. It's now kind of looked at as more of like a feminine thing, like masculine is like straying away from visual arts. Yes, yeah. I think it's a good question. I think there's also a history that com it comes out of which is problematic. It's not a new question. I mean, there's a slide of Annie Albers in the Bauhaus, and I, I mean, I taught at this uh, arts boarding high school, Interlochen, and it's all performing arts, dance, theater, um, music and now motion picture studies and visual arts and the visual arts was the, the women's art department right. and they had classrooms filled with dozens of looms because it was where women would go to study when they went to go study there um, and the Bauhaus was you know this very interesting integrated moment that was in certain ways a utopian moment in artistic production but it also um, Joseph Albers called Annie he called ceramics ashtray art and so, like, it, there's this legacy of craft and education, and craft being something that is highly um, pedagogical and about apprenticeship and teaching um, that continues to be part of art education today. And I think it's, I, I didn't answer anything except for a whole other history, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, I think it's, it, it's, it's very troubling to me, very troubling to me that I went through two art programs, all women. I mean, nearly 90% women. Well, sorry, this is, and I want you both to also answer the question, but in response to that, do you think then that it will start to be looked at or marginalized because it will be looked at as craft more than art when women are dominating it as a field? Well, you know, it, it, this is a very good question because, I mean, I think what you're doing is you're, you're putting in context that, you know, at least in, in modern times, women have been studying art. I mean, right here in Philly, more college of art and design, the only old women's art college in the country. So it's been going for a while, so where are they? But I can think of a field where, in a way, there was a switch, but then the whole field got devalued. Um, even that it took me a very long time to find a teaching job. I worked many years as a secretary. And the secretarial profession used to be male and highly respected. And then women started studying to become secretaries. It became predominantly female. Pay went down. Mm -hmm. And now to sort of get a little more respect, a lot of secretaries are now called administrative assistants. Well, is that like why they created administrative assistants day? Like if it was male administrative assistants, they wouldn't need a day. Right, would exactly. There. I mean, you know, I, I, and Franklin Marshall, our department secretary, who's this wonderful woman, is now an academic coordinator. Right. And, you know, so it, it, you know, there are shifts in professions. Right. What I'm not sure could happen unless somehow there's some shift in the market, is will, even if male artists become fewer, maybe they'll become even more valued, I don't know, in yeah, terms right. of dollar amounts, because yeah. there's fewer, you know, there's right. less of their right. scarcity, right. it's market, right? <laughs> right. I, I don't have a clue. Yeah. Well, I just think it has to be a deliberate action, so that just being more women in those positions won't necessarily maybe make as much of a difference as um, everyone sort of paying attention to who's being included right. or excluded. Um, and I don't know if this statistic is still accurate, but um, I know that at least at some point, um, more women held positions in nonprofit organizations, and those are also lower paying jobs mm -hmm. usually. And so they're, you know, there are more women in higher nonprofit Position, but still income is. Well, there, there are more women in academia, right. but fewer yeah. women achieve full professor mm -hmm. status. Right. They retire at a much lower uh, yeah. retirement than the men. Right. And like the respect levels seem to be different when it comes to women professors as compared to men professors, because like when you're an art teacher, as a thing, you can look at it, women as being just like, uh, they're like an art teacher, they're eccentric. <laughs> Whereas men, you look at it, it's like they're esteemed. It's that kind of valuation in the same overall. And I went to, I went to Micah's, this is like 
a little separate from that, but that's that's how it was. And I know in different art school, it was the same. When, when were you at Micah? Uh, 2005 till 2009. It sounds like not much has changed. No, I lived at Micah. <laughs> no, I, I, I ended up going to UC San Diego for yeah, that school, no, but I lived at Micah. I've been there for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not much has changed. But we also have to like give. I mean, massive props to a generation of women that were in the opposite realm and the, the, the disconnect, I think. I mean, we all just have to force ourselves to think about that always because I meet older female artists that went through Yale's program and they said, well, I was like one of three or something. And, you know, they're all becoming art stars and that's great. But because they have this name, but like, you know, they were filling a little um, allocated <laughs> role. Um, and that's, that's dangerous, and it's also dangerous to their practice when they're not having a dialogue with other contemporary female practitioners. And um, I mean, everything needs to be in balance, but also, I mean, how do those women now relate to teaching tons of women? I mean, sure, it's with enthusiasm, um, but you know, hopefully, there's a new kind of mobilization that can happen out of having those kinds of um, role models in the classroom. Um, and I hope those lessons are getting passed out to you know, the students. So this conversation seems to relate to what Virginia said earlier that this is a much bigger issue than the art market, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, we can't change the patriarchy in you know the fine arts field if the patriarchy is still alive and well <laughs> beyond us, right? So, right? But we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, maybe one. Well, I don't have any questions to comment. I mean, I think it really does start with our mothers and, and with us being mothers. Like, I just ordered my daughter, she's two. I ordered her, you know, the top 100 women you need to know about. And because she loves to read, so why not expose her to this, you know, at age two? And show her, you know, heroic role models and let her know that she can do anything and get her, like, you know, not pink <laughs> kits that she can build and, you know, maybe she can be an engineer. So, you know, I feel like my mother really instilled that in me, and my husband is not sexist, so it's, you know, I feel like hopefully as the years go on that things will change, you know? We can, I think awareness is, is a huge part of it. Just becoming aware of the problem is sometimes part of the solution. All right, well, thank you so uh, much, everyone, for coming. Okay. Maybe oh. if this works, I have a closing Video. Oh, check out Just this for a minute. Let's see if it. Yeah. All right, it's the very last one. All right, let's see if this works. <laughs> this is a lenticular that the Women's Caucus for Art did based on the Corvée. Okay. <laughs> Can you see it? Uh, that's I think that's a good ending. <laughs> Part of Jerry Saltz getting kicked off at Instagram. So, our bodies are the so dangerous. Ah, on that note, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our Linda and the women um, of our in initiative. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.